All right. Welcome, everyone. Again, my name is Jeremiah Vardaman. I'm with the University of Wyoming Extension. Really glad to have this, this opportunity in this webinar. Today, we have two presenters from Montana State University. Uh, this effort is to uh, provide an update on the research that is happening with Montana and Wyoming, collaborating with them on their efforts. Uh, of exploring alfalfa weevil management specifically for resistance, but also their research and study on uh, resistance and where they're finding those populations out there. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our, our two uh, panelists today. Uh, Dr. Kevin Warner is out of Montana State University. He's their crop entomologist and extension specialist up there. Really glad to have him. He's the leader and the PI of this research project. Um, and effort. And then our other panelist is Erica Rodbell. She is a, a PhD student uh, that is working under Kevin Warner and pretty close to finishing, I believe. And so really excited. This is her work. This is her. She's the one out in the field really helping Kevin do this. Uh, really excited to see what they, they have found. Uh, we've done this study now for two years. So we did it back in 2020 and now 2021. And so this is just a highlight update. And then we want to have a discussion of how that's applicable. How do we apply that out in your fields uh, or as your crop advisors? Um, and then at the end, we're gonna open it up for Q and A. And so please bring those questions forward. This is, we really just wanna get the information out there and help you. That's the whole point of this. So without further ado, I'm gonna be quiet. I'm gonna turn off my video. Uh, Kevin, take it away. That's great. Thanks, Jeremiah. Thanks for a great introduction. Um, Yes, yeah, so a few years back, it became clear that uh, there was a emerging problem with uh, insecticide resistance in alfalfa weevil. There were some early reports from various Western region states. Um, along with Ian Grettenberger at uh, UC Davis, we were able to get some uh, USDA funding to uh, really take a look at this issue uh, early on. It looked like it was an emerging issue. We wanted to get some research in Western region states. So we're able to get some USDA funding to do that. And um, with help from extension personnel in various Western region states, we've been able to, to get some regional information on this problem as well as for Montana and Wyoming. So as Jeremiah mentioned, we'd like to update that, uh, uh, the information that we have so far and start a discussion about what we can do about this insecticide resistance. And, Hopefully in the, um, at the end in the Q&A period, also any feedback you've had, the audience has had from their experiences with alfalfa weevil control is, is really valuable. Um, as I mentioned, this is a collaboration with uh, UC Davis, Ian. So um, Jeremiah did a great job of introducing Erica who's working in my lab and Ian has a uh, student also, uh, Maddie uh, Hendrick, who's working in his lab. And of course, it's the students that are doing all the tough work in the fields. All right, so, oh, there we go. So uh, I'm gonna start off, uh, most of you are probably familiar with alfalfa weevil, but I'll start off with a general introduction. Alfalfa weevils, the adults are overwintering. Some will overwinter in the alfalfa field, in the crown. Others will overwinter uh, around uh, the surrounding field areas, anywhere where they can find shelter. In the spring, when it starts to warm up, those adult weevils are uh, migrating back into the alfalfa field. They're mating, and the females are laying eggs inside the al alfalfa stem. Uh, as it continues to be warm in the spring, those alfalfa weevil eggs are hatching, and the very tiny first instar larvae they crawl up to the developing buds, um, the, de the developing leaf buds, and they feed inside of the leaf buds. So they're hard to find those tiny first instar larvae. As the larvae continue to grow larger, then they'll start feeding openly on the leaves and they're a lot easier to see, a lot easier to, to, to survey. So alfalfa weevils are fairly easy to recognize. They're, they're green. They have a white stripe down the back and a, and a black head capsule. In our area, in our more northern latitude, um, alfalfa weevil larvae tend to peak pretty closely with first harvest. And then as we get into, say, end of um, June, early July, those larvae are developing uh, 
into uh, or they develop into the next generation of adults. And they do this, um, they form these pupae, which are the stage in between the larvae and the adults. And they'll stay in that stage maybe for about 10 days. And then the new generation of adults will emerge in July, typically in July. Now, weevils are typically adapted to cool climates. Uh, so they don't really like the hot part of the summer and they actually go dormant during the summer. So they're gonna have another dormancy period in the summer. When it uh, cools down in the fall, they'll become active again. They'll do a little bit of feeding as they get ready to overwinter and then they'll find a sheltered spot to overwinter. And so if you have any questions about their biology, uh, maybe jot it down and, and send it in a chat question to Jeremiah. What we really wanna talk about today is insecticide resistance. So this is a, a, def, a, a good practical definition of insecticide resistance. It's a genetic change that can be inherited a genetic change in the sensitivity of a pest population that is reflected in repeated failure of a product, so a repeated failure of that insecticide, to achieve the expected level of control when, when you use it according to the label recommendation. So you've used the, the label rates and you're not getting control. And the key here is that it's a, a genetic trait that's inherited. So when we talk about insecticide resistance, it's really helpful to understand what mode of action means. Um, IRAC is a industry academic collaboration at, that deals with insecticide resistance and they've, they define or they classify different insecticides into grouping, similar to what you'll probably be familiar with with weeds and herbicides. So um, this classification system, it identifies the insective active ingredient based upon the site of action or the target site within that insect. So each type of insecticide will kill insects uh, in different ways and, and they have a target site. The re so each MOA class will be, will rep each number will represent the same uh, site of action for that class of insecticide. The reason that's important is when resistance develops, it tends to um, develop for all of the active ingredients in the same classification. So you can have difficulties with several active ingredients that all belong to the same MOA, mode of action group. And again, these um, target sites, the mode of action, it's, um, these, these are uh, typically, uh, they're, they're the products of genes. So again, it's a, a genetic um, basis to the inherent in, to how these um, target sites are inherited. And that relates to the resistance. So when we're talking about mode of action, just a, a quick re review about labels. Most of the insecticide labels will include the a mode of action group on the label. So in the top right hand corner of this warrior label, you'll see it's a group three. So that's the mode of action grouping. And then under the insecticide, you'll see that the active ingredient is lambda cyhalothrin. And I'll mention this again later, but it's important. There's several different active ingredients within the pyrethroid class, um, which is termed MOA group 3A. Now, this stuff can be really not easy to remember. Um, IRAC, that, that group that I was telling you about, they have a phone app. And so if you were simply search in, uh, for phone apps under IRAC and MOA, you'll come up with this app that you see on the, the right-hand side of the slide here. And what you can do is you can put in the insecticide active ingredient, and then it'll tell you what mode of action grouping it belongs to. So that's just um, a helpful tool. But again, the point is it's really helpful to understand uh, mode of action groupings for resistance and resistance management. So next I'd like to just describe to you a little bit about how resistance develops in an insect population. So if we look at all these blue weevils with the S on them, that, that's meant to indicate these are weevils that are susceptible to the insecticide, to the toxin. Um, those are the ones that are, that are gonna die when you, when you apply that insecticide. But in any population, there's always a few rare individuals that are not susceptible, they're immune to that toxin, whatever that toxin might be. In this case, it's an insecticide and it's a pyrethroid insecticide. 
but the point is there's always a there there's always a small number of individuals in a population that are naturally resistant to an insecticide so when you go and you spray your insecticide your pyrethroid insecticide you're killing most of the susceptible individuals in that field in that population um, you never get all of them but you're killing most of them but the but you're not killing those rare individuals that just happen to be resistant genetically resistant so what you're doing is, if you were to repeat this spray over and over and over again for multiple years, you're changing the, the ratio of these rare resistant individuals. They're not so rare anymore um, to the susceptible ones. And again, this is a genetic trait, so it's passed along by mating. So you're getting a greater probability that these resistant individuals are mating and passing along that resistant trait to other weevils in the population. So then if you continue to spray, um, so now you see this population, there's more of the purple resistant ones. As you continue to spray, you just continue to select for these resistant um, um, weevils, these, these resistant purple ones in the slide, to the point where they become more common and they're now mating with each other and you have a highly resistant population because most of them now have this genetic trait where they're not susceptible to the pyrethroid insecticide. So that's sort of an explanation of how this arises from repeated uses of an insecticide on an insect population. So this is, we, we started um, receiving first informal reports of pyrethroid resistance in 2015, 2016 an alfalfa seed production area in Southern Alberta um, in 2015, and also in 2016 in Scott Valley, um, where again, what, you're, what you start to see in highly resistant populations is you'll uh, uh, apply the pyrethroid insecticide several times and you're not getting any population control. So you're seeing in these areas after repeated applications, they were still getting 80 to 100 um, alfalfa weevil per sweep. And in, in the bottom picture, you'll see what a large number of alfalfa weevils looks like in, in a highly infested field. And um, there's also a picture of Erica in an alfalfa, we, uh, alfalfa field sweeping. So a couple of quotes from producers in these two areas, Scott Valley and Alberta, um, that where we first had reports of resistance, pyrethroid resistance. We've had to learn to live with higher levels, higher levels of the weevil. Once it's here, it's basically like a new pest. We really, really, we effectively don't have anything to control it. So I just put these quotes into my talk to illustrate that when you are in an area where resistance has developed, it, it's pretty frustrating for, for producers. So it's a significant problem. And again, what you're gonna be observing and what some of you may have seen already in your areas, well, you start to see uh, control failure. So Maybe over the years you used to use the low rate of your pyrethroid insecticide and it worked. Maybe you then had to go to the high rate and then suddenly the high rate wasn't giving you satisfactory control. Um, we'll see in these areas then, you know, you might apply your pyrethroid and there's failure of control. So maybe, maybe there was something else going on. So you apply a second application and you still don't get any control. And then the other observation we're seeing high, higher alfalfa weevil population. So you're in resistant areas, producers are dealing with alfalfa weevils on a more regular basis than they might have in the past because their populations are increasing. Um, so I'm gonna move to a, a little bit of a description. So our goal, we had some reports in Montana and our role at Montana State University, we had some reports from Southern Bighorn County, so we wanted to investigate those. And the way we, we wanted to demonstrate, well, is this really resistance? And so we started in the laboratory with some laboratory bioassays. This is a slide that Erica will talk about later because this is part of Erica's research. But um, the point is, uh, when, we get, when we initially received these reports, we wanted to generate some research data to, 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 to quantify, is this really resistance that we're dealing with? Now, just a quick slide to show you what these laboratory results look like in terms of what you're dealing with with a resistant population. And Erica will talk about this a little more in, in a bit. But in this graph, on the y-axis, you're looking at percent mortality. 
So how many of those larvae died in this laboratory bioassay? On the x-axis, you're, you're looking at, well, how much insecticide did we treat them with in this laboratory assay? And the group of insects on the bottom, the mortality never, uh, never reached 30% no matter how much of the insecticide we applied to them in the laboratory, even up to a rate that would be equivalent to about 30 times the label rate. Whereas what we expect to see, we expect to see that curve on, on the left-hand side of the slide where it's the, the mortality increases very quickly um, at lower amounts of the insecticide and it approaches 90 to 100% mortality. So the point, this is just to illustrate what we do in the laboratory. Uh, when you have a highly resistant population of insects and you bring them in the laboratory, you can treat them with high amounts of that pyrethroid insecticide and they just don't die. Now I hey, wanted Kevin. to uh, show you what- Kevin, I'm gonna break stuff. in. Sorry? Sorry, Kevin. Um, I no, had that's a question fine. for that's you. Um, yeah. So we have a question in the chat box. Are modes of action sites different for larvae and adults? So that's a great question. Are modes of action uh, sites different for adults and larvae? The, the answer is no, they're not different. So in the, in the case of pyrethroids, it's, it's a nerve toxin. So it affects uh, a receptor in, in, the, in the nerve cells of the insect. And so that target site will be the same in the larvae and the adult. Now, having said that, resistance is typically the same between um, adults and larvae, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the same because um, there are resistance mechanisms in insects that uh, there's a variety of different ways that they develop resistance. So in one case of resistance, that target site actually changes so that the insecticide no longer affects that target site, that, um, that target site in the nerve cell. But there's another mechanism where they produce detoxification enzymes in their, in their gut, in their stomach. And so they can um, evolve resistance either by change, either there's changes in the target site or they just create a lot of these um, enzymes that degrade the insecticide so it never gets to the target site. So kind of a big long explanation to say, mode of action doesn't change between larvae and adults, but, and most often we see if the larvae are resistant, the adults are resistant too. But there could be some rare cases where because of the mechanism of resistance, you might not see the same type of resistance in the adults and larvae. But I think we, we've, we haven't done a lot of work with the adults yet, but the work that Erica has done with the adults, they are, they are also resistant. Uh, do you think that sort of got at the question, Jeremiah? I, I believe so. Uh, feel free if there's follow-up questions to that, um, but I don't see anything right now. Thank you very much. And definitely, uh, I think it's good sometimes to get those questions in while we're looking at the slides and thinking about um, those questions. So definitely just um, feel free to jump in with those questions. Uh, so I'd like to show you a little bit of what resistance looks like in the field. Um, we started some field trials a couple of years ago. So this is a field in, in Southern Bighorn County where we have high levels of resistance and we conducted some ATV trials. And you can kind of see how severe the brown area in this slide would be kind of the buffer area between plots. And you can see how green the, the neighboring field is. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but basically, uh, it's kind of hard to see the outline of the plots. But in areas where we treated with a pyrethroid, like Warrior would be an example, Mustang Max are all pyrethroids. Essentially, there was no protection and the field was brown or the plots were brown. Um, so this was a field with a lot of weevils and they were resistant. And so just to sort of demonstrate the mode of action and the resistance, um, the graph in the slide here, if you look at the what's called the control, the bar there, those were plots that we didn't treat with anything. So we just didn't spray them with anything. 
And we were getting about 350 larvae per 10 sweeps in those plots. Um, and this was, I think, about 10 days after treatment. Lambda cyhalothrin, that's the active, that's a pyrethroid, active ingredient of things like Warrior. In this case, I think we used a generic called Grizzly 2. And we were getting the, the same number of weevils in the sweeps um, as we were in the untreated plot. So absolutely no reduction in the population by lambda cyhalothrin at the high label rate. And then that last bar in the graph labeled indoxicarb, that's the active ingredient of steward. And we haven't used steward in our region very much yet for alfalfa weevil, but it's been registered for a while. It's a different mode of action. It's MOA22A. It's a different target site in that insect compared to the pyrethroids. And you can see that we, we achieved you know, good control with the steward, um, reducing the populations to low levels. So you know, essentially, this is starting to uh, bring across the point that we're going to get at later in terms of rotating modes of action. Um, if we were to have used another pyrethroid, like say switching Mustang Max for Warrior, we most likely would have seen the same lack of control because it's again, it's a pyrethroid. But by switching to a whole different mode of action, uh, Steward, we then see acceptable uh, control. Now in this picture in the right hand side where we did these uh, ATV trials and you can see that browned up foliage from all the uh, alfalfa weevil feeding, well the producer, um, that particular year sprayed uh, steward on that field. So you can see the protection. Uh, basically that field would have looked brown if it was sprayed with pyrethroid versus the different mode of action in terms of steward. And I'll talk a little more about steward because a lot of folks may not be as familiar with steward and, and we can deal with that in the Q&A session also. Uh, I'm going to go through these slides kind of quickly, uh, just to give you, I'd like to at least show you, you know, when we, when we conduct this research, show you the data, but also I want to make sure I'm not cutting into our time for discussion at the end. But the trial, we looked at Grizzly 2 at the high rate, which is a, basically the say it's a generic of warrior, permethrin, another py pyrethroid, uh, steward at two different rates, a uh, seven ounce rate and 11.7 .7 ounce rate per acre and then an untreated check. These were the larval counts before we sprayed. So we just do this to say, well, we had pretty even larval populations before we sprayed. And then this is the number of larvae six days after treatment. And you can see treatment three and four, that's the uh, steward high rate and low rate. So both the, in this particular trial, we could talk about rates of steward later, um, in this trial, both the low and the high rate of steward work quite well. It's a different mode of action. And the two pyrethroids, Grizzly 2 and Permethrin, did not work so well on this resistant population. Whereas the T5 column, that's if you wouldn't have treated with anything. That's the untreated population. Um, this was six days after treatment. And then 13 days after treatment, we see the same trend. Um, lots of larvae. Absolutely no reduction in treatment one, which was the uh, grizzly two, the uh, pyrethroid. And then we're also seeing a similar trend in the adults, right? Because if, if the pyrethroids aren't killing the larvae, then we're getting more adults. So we're seeing in uh, treatment one and two, which were the two pyrethroids, 13 days after treatment, we have lots of adults emerging from those larvae that live. Whereas with the steward, we're killing the larvae, we don't have as many um, new adults emerging. Okay, so I just wanted to show you what um, that field data looked like. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the problem we're facing with alfalfa weevil. Oh, and hey, Jeremiah. Um, yeah, go ahead. If you could just keep track of the time for me and let me know, um, just, uh, just to make sure we're, we're keeping on track with time. If, sure. if I'm getting a bit long, just let me know. Okay, I've got a quick question before you move on. Oh, great, good. Uh, we have a question of what surfactant are you using with Steward? Ah, that's a great question. Um, and I don't have it. I'm going to have to get back to that. I don't remember it off the top of my head. I think there's a few that can be used, uh, but there's one in particular that the um, registrant, uh, the company that's FMC that uh, makes and sells steward recommends a certain surfactant. 
I don't think I used the one that I couldn't get my hands on the one that they recommended and we use. I'm going to have to, you know, I think the main thing is uh, the, 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 the main part of the surfactant is as a sticker to get better, um, um, better adherence. Yeah. In the chat box, we had a, a participant uh, put in a comment that you must use a silicone surfactant for steward. So uh, I, I don't know much about that, but that's one comment. Uh, ha, have, uh, yeah, if you can get that surfactant that you used um, while we have a little break for you, uh, that'd be great. Uh, had another question for you. Okay. In the T1 and the T2 sites, did you see an influx of aphids as a result of using a pyrethroid? That, that's, a, that's a great question. You know, were we seeing any correlation between steward and aphids? Um, we, didn't, we didn't have aphids in that field, uh, or at least not very many or not enough um, to really, to survey. Um, and in general, I don't know what your situation in Wyoming is like, but in, in Montana, you know, once in a while, we'll, and depending where you are, we'll have higher aphids, but not, we don't really have the aphid problems as, as you get farther south. Now I do know from our work in some of these other states where they do deal with aphid problems a lot, steward is supposed to be softer on the beneficials. I mean, we know that pyrethroids are really hard on beneficials. So typically you can have greater aphid problems when you use pyrethroids because you're killing the parasitoids of the aphids. Um, so we didn't, we didn't see any of that in this trial because we didn't have aphids and we weren't specifically looking at that question, but that's a good question, and 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 I think in areas um, where aphids are a problem, that's kind of an important question because we're not just dealing with weevil control; we also have to be worried about the rest of the pest complex. Um, but we, so I guess the way I would answer that is, steward is apparently easier on beneficials compared to pyrethroids, so you should presumably have in the long run less aphid problems if you're not using as much uh, pyrethroid active ingredient. Great, Kevin. Uh, just wanna let you know that Michael uh, joined us from California and he put in the chat box that in California, we use ethylated seed oil with Steward and have had excellent results, not a silicon-based surfactant. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Michael. I'm guessing on the surfactants, there's probably a variety of options and maybe depending on the conditions um, for your area. But I do know that, and I think it is the sticker part, maybe, I don't know if Michael has a comment on that, but you know that you do need a, 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 at least one particular, I'm not sure the type of surfactant, but it is important to have a surfa uh, some sort of surfactant in that the company recommends. Um, so one of the problems, or maybe the problem that we're facing right now with forage alfalfa for production, is that really if we, you know, what happens when we develop resistance to the pyrethroids? Well, let's take a look at, so here's a table with a list of insecticides that are registered for alfalfa weevil control. And you can see the gray box that I have highlighted, MOA group 3A, those are all different pyrethroid active ingredients. And it's hard to keep track, but there's a bunch of different trade names, but these are gonna be things you're familiar with, you know, things like Fastac, Mustang Max, Respect, Baythroid, Tombstone. I don't have Grizzly 2 in here, but that's a generic warrior. Um, so the point is, you're not gonna be able, say you get failure from Warrior, you're not gonna be able to simply switch to Mustang Max because they're in the same MOA group and they're all pyrethroids. And this is also why we're quite concerned about resistance to pyrethroids is because it's a large group of very effective and relatively inexpensive insecticides that we use for alfalfa weevil. Um, steward that we talked about a little bit, uh, it's become, it's, it's really, right now, it's, it's the, the most viable option for an alternative mode of action. And the reason it's, the only viable option for an alternative mode of action is that a lot of people are probably familiar with Lorsban, Chlorpyrifos, and there's been, you know, kind of some back and forth for a few years now, I think, on this registration. But the latest news that I've heard, it seems pretty clear that Chlorpyrifos is on the way out. 
And then the latest discussion I heard, well, maybe it won't, uh, maybe it'll still be available for crops that aren't used for food. But the problem, of course, with forage is it's used either for dairy or ca uh, dairy feed or cattle feed. So um, that's not going to uh, maintain uh, registration in, in that case. So it, it seems like it's almost certain now that uh, in the next uh, little bit, we're not gonna have Lohr's ban as an alternative. So we've lost that mode of action. It's a mode of action 1B, so we can't rotate with that. Um, some of these other ones like dimethoate used for aphid control, but not very, doesn't work for alfalfa weevils. And uh, so really, if you look at what's effective that we can use, it's um, endoxicarb steward right now. So we, have, we don't have a lot of insecticide mode of action options outside of the pyrethroid. So that's, that's the concern. Now, um, Erica, after this slide, um, we'll switch over to Erica, who's collected the data and can describe to you more in detail um, the data that she's collected. This is kind of a summary. I was saying that we've, we've been working in several Western region states with uh, support from the USDA. And we've classified those laboratory tests that Erica does. We've classified the populations into susceptible, so the pyrethroids still work, um, highly resistant. You spray and nothing happens. You know, you don't get any population reduction. And then in between, the yellow would be moderately resistant. So the red dots are highly resistant. The pyrethroids just aren't working. Um, susceptible, they're still working fine. And then the yellow is kind of that in between where they're becoming resistant. And this is just like a very simple um, figure showing kind of generally the results that we found. But but the point here is that if you look at the red dots in every state, pretty much every state that we went to and when, when um, stakeholders pointed us towards an area where they thought they had problems, sure enough, we found resistant alfalfa weevils. So what this tells us is that the, the genetic basis for resistance to pyrethroids is really well established across the Western region, probably across the United States right now. So that's one point, it's widespread, it's here. The other point is that every area that we tested also had susceptible um, alfalfa weevil populations. So that's the good news. So the resistance that we found so far appears to be in specific areas and specific pockets. Um, so in the areas where resistance hasn't developed, these are you know, particularly the areas that we want to uh, start incorporating some resistance management strategies to, re to, the, to delay the development of resistance. Oh, I think I have uh, just two more quick slides before we switch it over to Erica. These are uh, slides that Ian Grettenberger put together. Um, and um, California has a system for tracking insecticide use. So the point I just wanna make is again, you know, the different modes of action and what happens when resistance develops. We're seeing, um, I'll go to the next slide. In two cal counties in California where resistance has developed to the alfalfa weevil, um, when you look at the, the insecticide use, well, the pyrethroids are declining because they're, they're just not working anymore and producers are switching to endoxicarb. So there, there've been several areas in the US where we've already seen where producers are ahead of the research we're doing. They know the pyrethroids aren't working and they've been switching to endoxicarb just because basically that's what they, they have to do to get suitable control. All right, that brings us to um, Erica's presentation. So I think Jeremiah is gonna be able to switch our screens out. Yeah, if you'll just stop sharing your screen, Kevin. Uh, then Erica can share her screen and, and we should be able to switch. I can see it on my end, Erica, if you just want to put it into presenter mode. Yeah, there you go. You're, you're up and going. All right. Well, so Kevin mentioned Lambda Cyhalothrin and the resistance that we've seen in the Western region to this active ingredient. And I'm going to talk about that but I am also going to introduce two other active ingredients for the first part of my talk. And that would be zeta cypermethrin, another type two pyrethroid and permethrin, a type one pyrethroid. So type two pyrethroids like lambda cyhalothrin um, are essentially synthetic analogs of pyreth uh, pyreth or 
permethrin, sorry. Um, but regardless, the doses that we included in our bioassays included the minimum and maximum label rate. So doses four and five represent the concentrations in our bioassays cl um, closest to those label rates. Type one pyrethroids, so permethrin, um, are about tenfold um, more concentrated than that of lambda cyhalothrin, for example. And again, doses four and five represent the concentrations closest to the minimum and maximum label rates. So to do to run these bioassays, we collected alfalfa labels and brought them back into the lab. And after which point in time, we placed them in um, vials. And these glass vials were treated with one milliliter of a concentration um, and then allowed to dry completely on hot dog rollers. And what this allowed us to do was to ensure the even distribution of the active ingredient along the interior surface of the vial. Once dried, the vials were labeled and then stored in a dark cabinet or refrigerator until use. Um, and then after a two week period, if left unused, we sterilized them. Okay, so we collected alfalfa weevils. I brought um, weevils back to the lab with the help of, of our research team um, via sweep net collection. And then we placed them in paper bags and transported them back into the lab and they were fed clean alfalfa from the Montana State University greenhouses. So we placed 10 thir third and fourth instar larvae into the treated glass vials with five vials per dose. The vials were placed under tin foil and maintained at 24 degrees Celsius for a 24 hour period. And after that time period, we exposed the alfalfa weevil larvae to a heated glass surface, a Petri dish, heated to about 43 to 50 degrees Celsius, which is about 110 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. And what this was supposed to do, and it was very effective at it, was to help us determine which larvae were dead and which larvae were alive. And since we're dealing with an active ingredient that's supposed to kill these individuals, or at least um, slow them down significantly, this was very important for our data collection. So individuals were determined to be alive if they could uh, move more than one body length, and they were determined to be dead if they could not. All right, so we compiled our data, right? how many individuals were alive per vial, and how many were dead. And we determined that populations would meet one of three categories, so one of three resistance levels. The first was susceptible, so population was determined to be susceptible if the generated LC50 value or the lethal concentration that caused 50% mortality was less than the minimum application rate. Moderately resistant populations were those whose LC50 value was between the minimum application rate and 10 times the minimum application rate. And finally, populations were determined to be highly resistant if their LC50 value was greater than 10 times the minimum application rate. All right. So this is Montana, this is a map of Montana and each of the highlighted counties were sampled in 2020 and or in 2021. All right, so Kevin and I recently published a paper um, in 2020, earlier this year, I should say. And essentially what we, what we said, our major takeaway was we found highly resistant populations of alfalfa weevils in Montana, but it is isolated to Bighorn County, at least based on the data that we have right now. It's important to note though, that we did find some counties that had populations with moderate, a moderate degree of resistance to lambda cyhalothrin. Um, and like Kevin mentioned earlier, some populations in the state of Montana are susceptible to lambda cyhalothrin. All right, so moving on to zeta cypermethrin, another type two pyrethroid. What we found was that the same three populations in Bighorn County that were highly resistant to lambda cyhalothrin were also highly resistant to zeta cypermethrin. We had two populations tested against zeta cypermethrin that were moderately resistant with two populations being susceptible to the active ingredient. Permethrin, a type one pyrethroid, was also evaluated. And what we found was that the three populations in Bighorn County that, were, that was um, highly resistant to lambda cyhalothrin and zeta cypermethrin were moderately resistant to permethrin. And what we also found was that there were many more populations that were susceptible to permethrin than lambda cyhalothrin. 
One highly resistant population was identified and that was in Gallatin County, Montana. All right, so moving on to Wyoming. The populations that I'm going to discuss were collected in 2020 and or in 2021. And what we found was that Land of Cyhalothrin had two populations identified in Sheridan County and then another in Converse County that were highly resistant to the active ingredient. And then there was one population that was determined to be susceptible to this active ingredient in Plate County. When tested against zeta cypromethrin, again, the type 2 pyrethroid that was um, included in some of our bioassays, um, that one population that was tested in Plate County was moderately resistant. And then when we look at permethrin, all three populations that were evaluated against this active ingredient had LC50 values that determined them to be less than the label rate, thus they were con considered to be susceptible. So what does this mean? And Kevin hit, uh, touched on this earlier. Uh, it seems to be a regional problem. All hope is not lost. Um, susceptible populations do remain and it transcends alfalfa weevil strains. We found resistant populations as far south as the Arizona-Mexico border and we found resistant populations in Oregon, Washington, and Montana. So these are two alfalfa weevil strains, the Western and the Egyptian. And so it really kind of hones in on this point that we really do need to further document the extent of resistance in the West and identify the mechanism of resistance. Because if we're going to deal with this problem, then we have to figure out how these populations are resistant. All right. So Pyrethroid cross resistance in Montana. So I mentioned zeta cypromethrin, lambda cyhalothrin, and permethrin. Well, we decided to test five out of the six pyrethroids evaluated or labeled for the control of alfalfa label. So in the following slides, when populations were large enough, we were able to really do the same, the same bioassay, but with different active ingredients. So in the upcoming slides, I'm going to show you results for lambda cyhalothrin, zeta cypromethrin, alpha cypromethrin, beta cyfluthrin, bifenthrin, and permethrin. So the only active ingredient not tested thus far is gamma cyhalothrin. All right, so I'm going to focus, we have data from Madison County and Broadwater County, Montana, but I'm really going to hone in on Bighorn County as it is the only county in the state of Montana that we have identified a high degree of resistance to lambda cyhalothrin. So it really kind of highlights this issue in a very big way. And I'm excited to show you the results. Okay, so I mentioned earlier, there's a high degree of resistance in Bighorn County to lambda cyhalothrin as three out of the four populations that were evaluated in this county were highly resistant. The same is true for zeta cypromethrin. The same three populations were highly resistant against zeta cypromethrin and um, one population being moderately resistant. When we looked at alpha cypromethrin, a really, it's a very close or very similar active ingredient to that of zeta cypromethrin. Both populations that were evaluated showed a high degree of resistance to alpha cypromethrin. And um, I guess not surprisingly, these two populations were highly resistant to lambda cyhalothrin and zeta cypromethrin as well. Moving on to beta cyfluthrin. We found that two populations, so the same two, field sites one and four, were also highly resistant against beta cyfluthrin and field site two, um, so further south right on the bottom of the screen there, with being moderately resistant. So that's pretty interesting. When we uh, tested the four populations to permethrin, what we found was that the three populations in that county that were highly resistant to type two pyrethroids were moderately resistant to permethrin and with the northernmost field site being susceptible. What is really exciting to us and very interesting is that bifenthrin, um, a type one pyrethroid, was the only active ingredient that generated reasonable control against the two highly resistant populations that were tested against all of the other active ingredients. So that really is a really important point I would just like to highlight and note that bifenthrin is registered only for seed alfalfa, not for forage alfalfa. And um, so this is great news for seed alfalfa producers, but not necessarily for forage alfalfa producers. Alrighty, so another way of looking at this data is or to basically highlight this. So for the two field sites that were highly resistant to type 2 pyrethroids, what we found was consistent between both. Um, 
all type two pyrethroids that they were evaluated against were not effective at controlling these populations as LC50 values were far greater than, um, than the maximum label rate, about 10, more, greater than 10 times the maximum label rate. When we look at permethrin, there was a moderate degree of resistance. And again, as I mentioned earlier, when you look at bifenthrin, these populations were susceptible to this active ingredient. So it really, really hones in on this point that type, there's a, there seems to be a difference in efficacy between type two pyrethroids and type one pyrethroids, at least amongst um, highly resistant populations to lambocyhalophrin. All right, so what does this mean? It seems to indicate, you know, this is preliminary data, so Kevin and I still need to flush this out next field season, but it seems to be that there's cross resistance amongst type two pyrethroids um, and the additional active ingredients that I discussed earlier indicate no cross resistance or limited cross resistance between pyrethroid types. Um, and interestingly enough, type one pyrethroids like bifenthrin were the most effective. All right, that's my, that's my spiel. It's Kevin's turn, <laughs> take it away. Thank you, Erica. Yeah, if you'll just stop sharing your screen, we'll let uh, Kevin. Do you need to share your screen again, Kevin? I do. Um, All right, I'll just be a minute here to figure out what I'm doing. While we're waiting, is there any questions? Throw them in the chat box, throw them in the Q&A box. We'll try and address those. Um, the other thing, some people have joined a little bit later, but make sure if you have a commercial pesticide applicator's license, either in Montana or Wyoming, throw your name in the chat box or email me and uh, we'll get you credit for those. Um, if you have a certified crop advisor status or anything similar to that, throw your name and, and uh, number in the box for me so I, I can get that. And I'll throw my email address back in the box. Go ahead, Kevin. All right, thanks, Jeremiah. And time-wise, it looks like we're looking pretty good because I can finish up in uh, a few minutes. That'll leave us uh, the last half an hour for discussion and questions. Sounds great. All right. Okay. So um, thank you, Erica. And uh, you know, we we like to show you, especially at this early stage, the data that we're collecting. You know, because these are some sort of important um, considerations for management in alfalfa. So we wanna make sure we show you how we're, we're backing up some of uh, the conclusions we're coming to. Um, but again, just to reinforce that, that uh, finding that Erica's last, one of her last tables there, where you look here in this um, uh, table again, you'll see those active ingredients for MOA3A, the pyrethroids that Erica had listed in her table. And, and then if you look at the trade names, these are all a bunch of different products that we use for alfalfa weevil uh, management. And you know, in that highly resistant population, so when we do have a population that was highly resistant uh, to lambda cyhalothrin, which is warrior and the generics, those, those larvae were also highly resistant to all of the other um, pyrethroid active ingredients that Erica tested, with the exception of bifenthrin. Now, of course, the problem with bifenthrin is this, this will help um, seed alfalfa producers, but it's not going to help forage alfalfa producers because bifenthrin is not registered for forage alfalfa. Um, it doesn't have a tolerance, meaning, you know, they haven't done the residue studies and the feeding studies uh, to cattle and all that sort of thing for bifenthrin. So um, other than bifenthrin as an active ingredient, that was the only one that, uh, that, that the larvae were susceptible to and we don't have it available for forage alfalfa. So uh, just to lead into our discussion and, the, and um, question period. So, you know, we're, we're coming up with some early recommendations for managing insecticide resistant alfalfa weevils. And I'm saying early because, you know, we do want to um, consider this carefully um, and uh, 
Jeremiah, I think, is working on a document so that we can uh, eventually get some written recommendations out. But just immediately, some of the things that we would sort of recommend for um, managing insecticide resistance, ideally, you prevent or delay it from developing in the first place. But of course, we have it now, and we've seen it. We know it's well established because it's across the Western region. So after you have that genetic basis already established for resistance, then the goal becomes reducing its spread and severity. And we want to reduce its spread and severity so we can prolong the usefulness of pyrethroids um, as a class of insecticides that we can use for alfalfa weevil control. Now, before earlier in the talk, I talked about how it's a genetic trait and that repeated applications of that toxin, in this case, the pyrethroid, is the pressure that selects for those rare resistant individuals. The only way to um, delay, now that we have resistance, to de delay its spread um, is to reduce the amount of pyrethroid applications. And by reducing those repeated pyrethroid applications, we're, we're favoring the susceptible individuals rather than always the resistant individuals in that population. So, you know, some of the recommendations that are going to come out, they're not going to be easy because we don't have a lot of MOA uh, choices for alf forage alfalfa, but avoid repeated applications of the same mode of action, i.e. repeated applications of pyrethroid. Um, the recommendation for insecticide resistance management is always rotate your insecticide mode of action. Well, we don't have a lot of options. So, you know, we're, we're really talking about rotating steward. So in areas where resistance has not developed yet, we, we do, we will start suggesting, you know, that producers consider rotating, even though there's no resistance yet, we want to rotate steward and pyrethroids also with non-insecticide options, um, just to reduce that uh, continual selection for those resistant individuals. We want to be careful with steward, right? There's, there are some areas um, that have switched over to repeated steward use because they don't have a choice because you have that highly resistant population. Um, if the pyrethroids aren't working at all, you, you can't use them in a rotation. They're just simply not working. But we do want to be careful because if we simply switch to repeated use of steward, um, you know, 10 years from now, we could be in in the same situation where resistance is developing to steward. There, there's also um, a recommendation to really pay attention to optimizing your control when you do spray. And um, this is sort of related to, to a principle where, principle where when resistance starts to develop, um, it, it, it's, you're going to be able to um, possibly help delay it a little bit if you optimize the amount of control, optimize the population that you're, you're controlling. So when you're applying, you know, timing um, relative to the larvae, you know, surveying the larvae and timing, um, watching the weather and maybe not applying when the weather's a little bit iffy. And also rates, opti you know, going with low rates, you know, we're, we're gonna be going towards maybe more of the higher rates to optimize control. Um, in terms of steward, you know, the temptation, it's a more expensive product. The, the lowest label rate of steward, now I forget if what my slide said earlier, it might've been 6.7 ounces per acre, but you don't wanna go below that lower end of the label rate for steward because you're not optimizing control and, and that's not a favorable situation for future resistance. The other um, recommendations, you know, we're, we're going to want to pay a little more attention to those IPM recommendations, um, at least in areas where there's resistance, or if we want to delay resistance. In terms of applying an insecticide only when it's really necessary. And that's going to mean, you know, paying uh, more attention to uh, scouting, um, sampling the larvae, making sure you're reaching that threshold where there will be economic damage. Um, it's always a good recommendation to maintain a healthy stand where you can. Um, healthy stands will be able to compensate a little better with new growth after some weevil feeding damage. Um, harvesting early. So I think some 
some uh, producers have, have had luck with that. Maybe harvesting early isn't always an easy answer, but when, when the conditions are, are appropriate or conducive to harvesting early, um, rather than applying an insecticide, then you can remove those larvae. Um, sometimes you can get survival of larvae underneath the windrows, but in general, harvesting kills a good proportion of those larvae and you're salvaging that yield bef before those larvae have an additional seven or 10 days to feed. Um, avoiding multiple applications within the same year. So this is something that may come up in questions and discussion. Uh, there are some areas um, where early applications of pyrethroids are used for adult weevil control. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have any thresholds for adults. And so again, you know, whether or not, you know, from my perspective, from what I've seen in alfalfa weevil management, um, early applications for adults, you know, it is not going to be as reliable as treating at that when the larvae are present in the field. So although it, it, it may be an option, but as we're approaching this situation where we're losing pyrethroids, I would suggest that, you know, we may want uh, to have a discussion about, um, you know, how useful these early applications for adults really are because, you know, we're, that's just increasing our, our pyrethroid use again. Um, course rotation and in areas, rotation is gonna, is gonna be the recommendation rotating your active ingredient is gonna be the recommendation in areas where there is no resistance or areas where there's moderate resistance. But if you have high levels of resistance to the pyrethroids, you're just not gonna be, I mean, you're not gonna use them for three to five years because they're not working. Um, you know, I'm kind of hoping that maybe after three to five years, even in these areas where there's a high level of resistance, maybe the resistance will have come back to a level where pyrethroids can be worked back into a rotation where they're maybe used once every three years. But I think, and again, I'm saying these are early recommendations. We wanna have a discussion um, with extension entomologists and really make sure we come up with a consistent message about what we think is best. But I think at this point, um, you know, a rotation where pyrethroids are used maybe only once every third year would probably be helpful in reducing uh, the, the continued development of pyrethroid resistance. So if you're in an area where your pyrethroids are still working, you, you may want to consider only using that when possible once every three years. And the way you do that would be to one year a pyrethroid, one year steward, and, and maybe once every three years or so, the populations aren't high enough and you don't need to spray anything. So alleviate that pressure of um, repeated pyrethroid application. Okay, well that concludes my talk and um, we'll just, I think at this point, open it up for, or I'll leave it to Jeremiah, who will moderate the questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, we had one question in the chat while you're going, but I didn't wanna break your, your train of thought there, but is orthene available for weevil control? Orthene, let's see. Um, I would have to look that up. I don't know off the top of my head because, so we created this list at one point about products that are registered. I'm not familiar with or, that familiar with orthene. Um, so whether or not we, we missed it in this table or not, I, the answer is I don't know. Okay. Great. Uh, there was also another comment from Michael in California. And, and for those of you, uh, Michael is with Extension down there in California and doing research and dealing with insecticide resistance. And I believe he's collaborating with Erica and Kevin on their studies and helping that. And so that's where this information is coming from. Appreciate it, Michael. Uh, so he says there are some other classes of insecticides diamides and 5A spinosins, um, et cetera, with products that have looked excellent in California trials, but no idea if they will ever be registered in alfalfa or will be affordable if they are registered. So appreciate that. At least there's some ex exploration there. Uh, yeah, so at this time, we're turning it over to you. Throw out your questions. Um, if you wanna raise your hand, I'll try and monitor that. Um, and I might be able to unmute you and you could ask your question so you don't have to chat. Uh, also, uh, 
I'm going to kick it off. I don't know if we covered this, and if you did, I apologize, but I think it's good to highlight again. If I'm a producer, or if I'm a crop advisor, or anybody out there, how do, what am I going to look for and suspect as resistance, right? If I'm out there without these lab bioassay tests and that, how can I start determining, hey, I might have a resistance problem? Because the caveat I want to throw out there is, at least for the samples from Wyoming, we had very few samples go into the lab. And so just because their susceptibility in a certain county, it doesn't mean all the weevil in that county are susceptible or highly resistant, whatever it is. And the reason for that is um, we appreciate Montana State collaborating with us and taking our samples and testing that. That's an ability we don't have at UW. And so we appreciate the, the data, um, but it's really challenging to get research and, and get samples viable for this research project. And so two things are going on there. One is we have to have a high population in the field to sample to get the number of larvae to send off. And I, I can't remember the number, but it's like 2000 or more larvae, live larvae need to make it to Montana State University in the lab to test. And then they got to keep them alive and run through the analysis and do it multiple times. It's very convoluted, very challenging. Um, and so to find those kind of fields and have access to those fields is challenging to get those high population numbers and get a good sample. The second level to that issue is usually the, the fields that do have those high levels are being sprayed. And so it's hard to get in there and get a sample collected before those fields get sprayed. And, and then the complexities of collecting those across the state is very, very challenging to do. Um, but that, that's why we have few samples represented in Wyoming. Uh, Erica and Kevin are looking at doing this again next year. Um, and so we're, if you have fields or if you have um, an ability to collect samples for us and get them to Montana State, we can provide the supplies to do that and the shipping to get it there. Uh, contact me. I'll put my email in the, in the chat box again. But again, back to my question, what do we need to look for while we're out in the field? How do I determine if it was just an application error or if it's true resistance? What do we need to be watching for? So I'll, I'll, um, I'll address that, Jeremiah. Um, you know, I think, you know, what we've been seeing, um, I, I would say your, your, your own personal history with your fields. So if you found that you have had to go to, go to higher rates to get the same control, um, if you've been unhappy with the level of control for the past couple of years, we see this kind of start to build over a period of several years until you reach that point where it's really obvious where your field's brown, right? But even before that point, you start to see basically reduced levels of control, unsatisfactory control. Really, the pyrethroids, they should be able to give, uh, you know, uh, in a susceptible population, more than 90% larval reduction quite routinely. Um, so I would say your personal history. And then also, you know, we're not really seeing necessarily resistance on a single farm. We're seeing resistance, at least in a, in a, in a particular area. You know, the size of the area is going to depend. Uh, so, you know, if you're hearing other, you know, word of mouth that there's been difficulties um, uh, or unsatisfactory control. So the word kind of starts. So I think you, you would already have a suspicion. Um, second, um, it takes, a, you know, more effort, but we are facing this situation. Uh, if at all possible, you know, get an idea of how many larvae are out there before the spray is put down. Um, and, you know, we always use these sweet nets, but if you don't use a sweet net, there's a bucket technique where you can pick stems, count the number of stems you pick, shake them into a bucket, count the larvae, but some sort of idea of how many larvae are out there before you spray, and then go back after the spray. And, and again, a pyrethroid, you shouldn't be seeing a lot of larvae out there feeding afterwards in the resistant populations, you, you know. And, and I know I've heard in some cases, you know, I, I, would, I would suggest that you don't wanna go back into that field too quickly, meaning, yeah, pyrethroids can act really quickly, but you know, say we get some cool weather or there's different field conditions. I mean, I would really go wait 
four or five days to see that four, you know, four or five, even seven days, you're going to see, you should be seeing a large reduction of those numbers in your field. So, so that would be another way. And then finally, you know, if you really have the time, um, being able to leave a little corner, if it's ground equipment, turn your sprayer off just for, I know it's, it's hard, you know, it's tempting because you want to get them all, but you know, if you're in a, a certain area, a corner somewhere, turn that uh, ground rig sprayer off just for a small distance. You don't need a very big area. And then see what happens in that area that wasn't sprayed versus the sprayed area. Um, so those are all suggestions that I would uh, put forth. Awesome, thank you. Go ahead, Erica. Um, just kind of, I, I would just like to point out that I think there were three or four populations that we've tested against Lambda Cyhalothrin. Um, and those populations never exceeded 50% mortality. Um, there's one population in, in uh, Oregon that never exceeded 8% mortality, even at the highest dose tested, which was 30 times the label rate. So um, that kind of leads to my following point, where if you're suspecting that you have resistance, don't wait until it gets to be that bad because what you want to promote is the is the number of susceptible individuals in your field or within the population. So, um, so if you have an inkling that you are dealing with resistance, switch to a different mode of action or a cultural control tactic, and um, try and maintain those susceptible individuals if possible. Um, having 8% mortality, even at 30 times the label rate is something that one would like to, I would like to avoid that. Um, so yeah. Great. Point. Point. Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, it's, it's hard. It's challenging and it's a regional issue, right? It's not a field issue or a farmer's issue or a farm's issue or a ranch's issue. It, it's a, it's an area. And so it's really, we got to work together in this and, and be talking through this. Um, and so it's challenging that. And then on top of it, the other complexity that is there for insecticide resistance in insects, which is different than herbicide resistance in weeds, is insects are mobile. And so that population is going to be mobile. So that area control that is happening, it's not just your property that makes the difference, right? It's that bigger, larger perspective. Great, uh, a couple, uh, we got a few questions in here. Um, so first question, could the addition of a synergist BPO with type one pyrethroid, uh, like a permethrin, in areas where the population is still susceptible, enhance control and provide an effective rotation option with steward? So uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, there are with the specifically with the pyrethroids um, that uh, adjuvant you can add. Uh, there might be more than one, but the one I'm thinking of is I think it's PBO. Um, but the unfortunate so in some cases PBO can increase the effectiveness of a pyrethroid in a resistant population, but not always, and it depends on the mechanism. So we actually tested that just this last season, and uh, we did the lambda cyhalothrin and the permethrin plus or minus PBO and saw no effect for the PBO. Um, so at this point, you know, maybe the mechanisms of resistance don't need to be the same in all areas. Um, so maybe at this point, it doesn't appear that PBO is effectively uh, on on this particular on, on alfalfa weevils that are resistant. It's not not working. So that that's an unfortunate, yeah. But that was awesome. a good question. Yeah. Our next question is: Has there been any evaluation of fall application timings to target adults? That's that's another great question. And you know what? What's really uh, struck me by being able to be involved in more of a regional uh, project. The alfalfa weevil, uh, their development, you know, some insects are really locked into a schedule. You know, they, uh, they automatically go dormant in the fall and then they automatically come out of dormancy, you know, during, during a certain crop stage. 
But alfalfa weevils are really responding to the temperature. They're kind of a moderate temperature. So um, this is going to be a bit of a long answer, but I don't, I'm not, uh, I should get to the short answer for the person quickly. Uh, I'm not aware of a lot of fall trials, but I guess where I'm angling towards this is that it depends on what area of the country you're in, because there are some areas where there's fall activity, fall egg laying, and even a fall generation of larvae. And in those areas, you know, a fall application and fall trials makes a lot of sense. So really, whether or not we want to target adults in the fall, I guess, is sort of the question. And in, in our more northern latitudes, the eggs aren't overwintering in the stems. And so in general, what you find with insects, um, targeting the adults prior to the larval damaging stage, when the larvae are the damaging stage, uh, can typically produce is, is pretty variable. And one of the reasons is, you know, you don't know where they're coming from or, or when they're coming into your field. So say you do a fall application and you reduce the numbers a bit, but you may not reduce the numbers enough. And then the other factor is, it's the females that are laying the eggs. And you don't need a whole lot of females to get in there and lay their eggs. So we've seen this with other insects where when, when you have to target the adults, it's much more challenging than targeting the actual stage that's doing the, the larvae. So I'm not aware of any trials and I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, in our climate, I wouldn't be very optimistic. Maybe in areas of the country where you have a fall egg laying and fall larval development, that, that could be a, a different, different story. Great. I think the other thing I'd just throw in on that, uh, at least with the adult control and that it, it pertains to a fall application, but also the early spring application of trying to catch those adults before egg laying. Uh, the challenge is um, timing that when the adults are actually vulnerable and in the field. Um, and, and those adults in the fall are moving out of the fields. They're moving to edges of fields. There's research out of Utah showing that adult weevils are moving up dry drainages um, in the badlands that border those fields. And so it gets into that, what is around that field also, that, that landscape perspective and where are those weevils moving? Um, but if they're not in the field and we spray the field, you know, we're not doing us any good anyway. But then also in the spring, timing that for when the weevils have moved back into the field so when an application can be effective. But then it's challenging because we gotta have control of those adults, enough control before they lay the eggs. If we wait too long, the eggs have already been laid, the adults you could have good control of, but you don't have control of the pests. So it's challenging, that's a great question. We have a uh, couple more questions. So could we pursue a 24C label with bifenthrin for forage alfalfa? So another great question, and I've been thinking about that. And uh, you know, when I get a chance, I, I talk to different people, but here's my understanding. I'm you know, not ultimately, not an expert on all of that registration stuff. So I, um, but my understanding with bifenthrin is there's no tolerance. And so if there's no tolerance, you're stuck. Meaning a tolerance, meaning um, they have to do residue studies and then they have to do, so in the case of forage alfalfa, the studies would have to include, um, you know, feeding to cows and testing the milk. And so you're looking at, I think, you know, well over a million dollars. And then the next problem is, I think bifenthrin is now a generic. So the motivation or the ability of any particular company to invest in paying all that money to develop a tolerance for alfalfa when anyone can make and sell the product is limited. So um, that's my understanding of, of the challenge. So in, unless there's some other way to generate, uh, you know, that kind of funding to uh, generate a tolerance, because I think on the end user, you know, the end user, you know, we don't really mind who's making it um, and selling it, but we, we would like it available. But then you get into the whole economics on the, the other end for the companies where whether it makes sense for them to, um, put that development money in. But if there was some other way other than a single company having to bear the burden of developing that tolerance, uh, I don't know. But it, we, we would need a tolerance, which would be you know, residue and feeding studies. Awesome. Okay, our last question that I'm seeing right now, but a real, another really good one. 
how does this information change in areas with one to one and a half cuttings versus areas that have four cuttings a year? Right, and uh, so the number of cuttings, how does this information change depending on the number of cuttings that you have? Um, and then if we keep on going south, you know, they're, they're getting up to nine cuttings per year. Um, you know, as far as the alfalfa weevil biology goes, even when you go to the warmer areas, there's still only one generation of that insect per year. Um, so we're, you know, weevils aren't, say, like some of these other insects like thrips that go through multiple generations in the same year. So maybe you're dealing with multiple generations of that pest throughout the growing season. Weevils, you know, you're getting one generation. Now, of course, depending on the climate again, if you notice last year, we were so hot that weevil development period was scrunched up into a very short amount of time. It was, they were there, they grew really fast and then they were gone. You go into more milder climates and you might be dealing with weevils for two, three months in your alfalfa so they could span <clears throat> span multiple cuttings. Um, so I think the number of cuttings, you know, one, one you know, I, I think part of it relates to the economics, I suppose. Um, you know, if you're getting multiple cuttings per year, you're getting more value out of that area. Um, but in terms of resistance management, um, the number of cuttings, the management recommendations, I think, change a bit when you get into multiple cuttings. Multiple cuttings are in warmer areas, they have a larger pest complex. So you're starting to have, you're, you're having to think, well, I'm not just applying insecticides for weevil, I have to worry about aphids and other insect pests. Um, and then the timing for the weevil. So here we're pretty synchronized with first harvest, but in areas with multiple cuttings, that's not the case. So where in that crop stage are the larvae peaking? Um, but, it, but I think the general, the general principles for the resistance management aren't going to change that much. It's more the practical um, changes that occur with the different cropping systems. But yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know if Michael's still online. Michael would be someone who might, uh, who is in an area where they're fortunate and they get several cuttings. Uh, Michael might have something to add to that. Yeah, so I guess I'd throw in, we get three cuttings here in PAL, uh, typically in a year. Um, in the off year, we could possibly get four. That doesn't change anything uh, in terms of alfalfa weevil management, because we still only get one generation of alfalfa weevil. And it's really on how it, I think it's more important of the control measures of those alfalfa weevil. So it depends on the area you live and the type of weevil you have. Um, so if you go down south in Oklahoma, Texas, Arizona, those cases where they have, like you were saying, Kevin, those multiple uh, alfalfa weevils in multiple cuttings, they have that long and, and might have two life cycles within a year. Um, then it's a, a bigger issue and resistance probably could develop a little faster, especially if we're spraying the same chemical two or three times a year and then every year that way. Um, and so it can build up. That, that's the one thing I'd throw back in on that. But yeah, I, it would be good to hear from Michael that's actually dealing with it as well on that front down in California, Southern California. So uh, well, our, Go ahead. I'll just jump in quick, Jeremiah. You mentioned Oklahoma, and maybe this is gets at the question a little bit too. Yeah, so it's not just the number of cuttings; it's the weevil, the the how long the weevil is around for development. And so, my understanding, when you get into that area uh, like Oklahoma, they have no choice but to have to apply multiple times per year for weevil control, whereas we. We're, we're more synchronized, so we can effectively control weevils with one application time, you know, before first harvest. But in some of these other areas where, where um, like Oklahoma, my understanding is maybe at the six to eight inch stand height, they have to come in with their first application, but then they're still, they're not getting enough persistence and control for, uh, you know, that period prior to harvest. So. And of course, if you're having to apply the pyrethroid multiple times in the same season, again, you're, you're, you're going to increase how quickly resistance develops. Yeah. Okay, our last question that I'm seeing again, um, 
I see that I'm, I'm going to butcher the chemical name. <laughs> Chloranotranniprol. So Corrigan, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it either, but. <laughs> <laughs> so that chemical, it, I think the generic names are Corrigan, Preventhron, um, is available in Besiege, but with a pyrethroid included is not good for the resistance problem. Do you think that those chemicals, Corrigan and Preventhron, might be a, a, an option if we can get the company to label it? So, um, from what I've seen, and, 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 and I, I, would, I would want to go back and review, so I'm make, making sure I'm saying this accurately. And again, Michael's done a lot of insecticide, not to always say, hey, Michael, but uh, he's done a lot of insecticide testing. I'm pretty sure, so, so the first thing is when, you're, when you take these products and you're mixing a pyrethroid in with them, we would still have to treat it in a rotational way as if it were a pyrethroid. Um, now, um, are we going to increase the effectiveness of the pyrethroid by adding another active ingredient? So that might be a reasonable strategy in terms of, okay, so we have an area where resistance is moderate. We're getting some control, but not great control. Well, when we want to come in with that one in three years of a pyrethroid, can we use one of these combined products um, to increase the effect effectiveness? So I think I think it's possible that we could, you know, head towards that direction of, um, but on their own, without a mixture, on their own, they don't seem to be very effective from alfalfa weevil, from what I have seen or can recall, um, uh, that particular mode of action on its own. And then the other thing I'm not sure of, I think they're probably effective. I can't remember if that's a product that's really effective on like um, caterpillars, lepidoptera larvae, um, and maybe aphids. So it may be that that product is used for, you know, a different set of insects, but gotcha. um, what are the chances of getting that registered? I think from what I've seen at the companies, so our first hint that they're looking at it is when they enter these products into trials. And I have seen these trials being tested in alfalfa fields, these products. So, so they're at least looking at it. What are the chances? Um, I'm, I'm not certain at this point. Michael has put in the chat box that Prevathon is registered. Oh, um, it, is registered. it is registered. It is not as good as Stewart in his trials that he is conducting there in California. And then he also threw in a, a point to, just for clarification, uh, down there, they only see one solid alfalfa weevil generation per year. There are some years they see a second, but it's very rare to see this. So again, on that management, um, they're still only seeing one generation. So great. Anything else on that last question, Kevin? Uh, no, other than, um, you know, we are, we are looking, we're trying to find these other products and we are, we are, so I didn't uh, show that in any of the testing, but we are trying to do field tests and talking to these companies to figure out what products might be in the pipeline. And we're trying to get those into the field test to, to see how effective they are. Awesome. Another question has come in. Have you considered mixing uh, modes of actions rather than just rotating? Can you speak to that? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And um, mixing, say, two modes of action. Um, you know, when you get into this, not to get off track too much here, but just to say to the audience, when you get into this insecticide resistance and you get into the biology of it, then you start talking to people who are geneticists, you know, who do this genetics work. It's a bit of a, 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 a what I would call a can of worms in that, you know, it, you know, whether, how quickly insects develop insect, insecticide resistance, you know, is, is, is not just a clear cut, simple biological answer genetically. Now, what I will, so what I'm saying is there is this idea out there that you can mix two different modes of action and possibly delay resistance because it's gonna be really rare to find those insects that are resistant to both. So the idea is if you have some, a few developing resistance to one mode of action, the other one that you've mixed in is killing those and vice versa. 
but in, but in general, th then the concern is the concern is uh, you know if you do select for resistance, you might select for resistance to both of those modes of action. So in general, I have not heard a lot of support for biological support for mixing two modes of action um, to prevent resistance from developing. I think a really interesting story, and I'm not up to date on it, but um, you know there was some effort with that with the uh, transgenic you know traits with corn. So the BT toxins, and they called it stacking. So they would stack different BT toxins to to try and reduce. But I, I'm not certain how effective that was. Um, so here's what I will say. So so what I'm this is where I, I do want to make sure that before we come out with firm recommendations, we have a lot of discussions with colleagues. Um, but my impression at this point is, if you're going to mix two modes of action together, it's to increase the effectiveness, not to delay resistance. So again, say we're starting to see moderate resistance to pyrethroids. Well, can we add another active ingredient so we can still use that pyrethroid in our rotation and get acceptable control. But it's not really going to be a strategy to delay resistance. Yeah, I, I'm. that's been my conversations okay. as well, Kevin. Um, uh, it's different though too, right? So from a weed perspective, that's what I'm hearing for resistance management is, is that actually tank mixing of different modes of action that are both effective against that weed is, is the recommendation or, or moving that way. That's what I hear from that end of things. But in terms of insecticide resistance from the scientific community, from the research that's out there and colleagues, everybody that I've talked to, it's not encouraged um, besides what you just uh, articulate. It's not encouraged in terms of delaying resistance. Um, and it has to do again, the best answer I've, I've come up with and found from, from other colleagues is, is because of the mobility of insects. Is right. that that mixing of the, the population in the area is, is where that becomes an issue. But th that's, yeah, good question. And, and I, think, I think it's fair to say that the scientific community is still working and struggling on this. We don't have a clear, cl clear cut answer and direction for managing resistance. We, we have indications and some good research hinting towards it, but we don't have the clear cut answer. Would that be fair to say? That's, you know, every, you know, you're going to get just like any other area of whatever, you're going to get different opinions in science, you're going to get different opinions in different areas. But that I would agree. That's my opinion. My opinion is, you know, it's, it's always different. You know, we try to base our recommendations as much as we can first on sound science, but also on the biological principles. But, you know, taking that and going into everyday practice in a practical sense is another question too, right? And so I do think it is, it, it, it isn't like just a simple cut and dry answer. There's a lot of, well, it depends on this or it depends on that. <laughs> right, and well, so, and if it was a, if it was a clear cut answer, we probably wouldn't be here today talking about right. it. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. Good point. Yep. And that's all I have. That no more questions. Throw them in the chat if you have them here. We'll catch them at the last minute. The the last thing I want to wrap up is first of all, thank you so much to Erica and Dr. Warner for their time and energy in this and being willing to do that. Um, I really appreciate it. We have a, a in the Q and A box a thank you to Jeremiah, Kevin, and Erica. Just so if you guys aren't watching that, uh, so. We really appreciate everybody's time and, and attending this session. Uh, been really good. I'm going to throw my email address back in the chat box one last time. The, the things I'm going to do. One is we'd love to hear from you. Give me a phone call. Send me an email. We want to hear your perspective, what's going on in your area, uh, what's happening, uh, any information that you think is valid for us to, to think about, consider, weigh in on this. As, as we move forward. Um, the second thing, future efforts. So what is going on with this? Where are we at? There's a few things happening. One, Kevin mentioned it, but um, I am collaborating with, with Erica and Kevin, but also with Nebraska, Utah, um, Scott Shell, our UW extension entomologist here. We are working at drafting up 
uh, insecticide resistance handout brochure um, just to highlight some of this stuff that we talked about today. But then it can be dispersed. People are aware of it and that knowledge moving forward. So we're trying to pull some of this so it is unified information supported by uh, our neighboring states in our area and from those crop uh, entomologists. And hopefully we'll be getting that out early next year for you um, and we'll get it to you as soon as we can. The other thing that, again, I mentioned the study's gonna happen again next year. We we're really excited. If you want to collaborate, on this, if you want to help us get samples, if you have fields that we could sample, anything that way, we, I'd love to chat with you. It's going to be a nightmare to coordinate, but I'm willing to do it. Uh, we would like that help and, and help the state and help you in your area get a hold of me. Okay, I'm going to, as I'm talking, I'm going to throw my name here in the, or my email address again in the chat box. So email me. Let's do that. Um, love to chat with you. In terms of, uh, and Kevin mentioned it as part of our controls, non-insecticide controls. I want to mention that Dr. Uh, Rinda Jabor down at the campus at University of Wyoming, she is, is working on some research that way. And they just finished up some trials this year, this summer, uh, on a early harvest um, uh, early harvest study on alfalfa. And so it was looking at the timing of that harvest and how it impacts the control of weevil populations. And so uh, stay tuned. Um, she's really excited. They're in the process of looking at the data, analyzing the data. So hopefully we can highlight that early next spring or next summer or next fall, whenever that data is ready to share. But we're also going to try and incorporate that research into uh, this resistance discussion and management. Uh, so a lot going on, touch base with us. Beyond that, uh, I got something else in the chat box. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bill, for joining us. He said, thank you, great session. Yeah, uh, and I appreciate the comment about the picture in the background. Unfortunately, that's not the view out my office window. Uh, it's just a virtual background created in the meeting. But yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate everybody's time. And again, with that, contact me. Uh, if there's anything I can do to help you or I can put you in contact with Erica and Kevin, we'll do that. Uh, we're here for you guys. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin and Erica. It's been great. Um, and with that, I'm going to end the session. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone.